Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Theo Hikmat here. Friends call me Jason Zelda, singer, songwriter, and Bible teacher. Well, I'm back. It's been a little while. And uh, on the table, usually it's filled with books, but today, only one book. Word of God. I want to take a few moments to talk with the XJW community. Some important stuff. You guys know I don't do videos every week, every month. I do videos every once in a while if I feel it's important. So obviously there must be something on the table that I think is pretty important. I have been uh, watching some things that are happening out there in the world as far as the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses is concerned and some tactics that they're using. And I wanted to bring some of this stuff to your attention. My friend J.W. Escape has been informing people that the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses have been changing their tone a little bit. They have been speaking in more of a militant style as of late, talking more about their enemies, always coming out and attacking who they call apostates. They seem to have a new vigor, a new strength about them that they feel bolder than ever, that they can actually confront who they consider as their enemies and attack them openly, knowing that nobody's going to do anything to them. If you went and threatened somebody with death, as the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses regularly does to former members, you could be charged with something. But for some reason, the leaders of this group can just threaten and threaten and threaten in publications and videos, and nothing happens to them. Are they somehow above the law? Now normally, I would pull out the little green book, Insight on the Scriptures, and show you the book written by the Jehovah's Witness leaders to the members, in which the leaders explains to Jehovah's Witnesses what lying means. What does it mean to lie if you're a Jehovah's Witness? Well, they wrote there, lying generally means not telling the truth to one who's entitled to know the truth. They go on to say, although malicious lying is definitely condemned in the Bible, that doesn't mean that one is under obligation to divulge truthful information to those that are not entitled to it. So when I begin to understand that their definition of lying is basically to protect their reputation, if there's any news that comes out that makes the group look bad, they want to make sure that, that news never comes out. Well, Whenever somebody leaves the group, they leave the group with news that the information, the leadership doesn't want the outside world to know. The leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses knows that the number one tool that is used by former Jehovah's Witnesses to free people from their spell is YouTube. The events of 2020 that locked down the whole planet left a lot of people sitting at home locked down with nothing to do. So a lot of people began going on to YouTube and waking up. This has angered the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses as they've been losing their grip on their members. Day after day, week after week, they're not allowed to go to the indoctrination centers called Kingdom Halls. And more and more people are waking up. They want to find someone to blame. So they're blaming the former members who they call the apostates. And they've been trying to find a way to silence you behind the scenes. As I mentioned a few moments ago, their definition of lying is not telling the truth to one who is entitled to know the truth. And I've told Jehovah's Witnesses time and time again that when they talk about those who are not entitled to know the truth, they're actually talking about their own members who they feel are not entitled to know the truth. So they regularly hide information from their own members. One of the things that they've hidden from their members is their constant connection with world governments, world leaders, and world authorities. They tell their members they have nothing to do with world governments, nothing to do with politicians, and certainly nothing to do with what they call the great wild beast, the United Nations. But as I've told people for a long time, 
the Jehovah's Witness group never officially left the United Nations in the early 2000s. They stayed in under a number of different names. And every year, almost every year, they petitioned the United Nations through overseas branches. Petitioning the United Nations with these long, drawn-out letters claiming that the Jehovah's Witnesses are being persecuted in this country, Jehovah's Witnesses are being persecuted in that country, Jehovah's Witnesses are being beaten up here, kingdom halls burned down there. And what they desire is they desire to have the same power over the whole world that they have in Canada. Now, what kind of power did they have in Canada? In 1975, a lady was disfellowshipped from the Jehovah's Witnesses. Her name was Laurie McGregor. She was one of the first XJW trailblazers. They falsely accused her of committing adultery and they kicked her out of the group. But she was smart enough to come out of the group with a lot of information. But back in the 70s and 80s, there was no internet. There was no YouTube. There was no social media. So how was she going to get her word out? She had to do it the old school way. She contacted churches and hoped that somebody would let her come in and speak. And what she learned is that many Christian churches are open to have ladies speak. She would contact Christian radio programs and discovered many of them were open to allow her to come on and tell her story. And she began to present to the world a side of the Jehovah's Witness group that had been hidden from the public. A side that the leadership never wanted the public to know. She also exposed the Mormons, the Seventh-day Adventists, and the mega-rich, mega-church preachers, and a lot of their false teachings. Needless to say, she made a lot of enemies in high places. Very rich, powerful people who wanted her silenced. They knew that they couldn't silence her, and to kill her would simply make her a martyr. They had to find some way to silence her quietly, and they found a way. In Canada, they passed something called hate crimes legislation. The hate crimes legislation is written in such a vague way that a cult can actually use it to silence the people who are exposing the cult. So it was used against Laurie. Laurie tells the story that the Canadian government came to her and gave her an ultimatum. It says either you start teaching that all the religions are all the same and that they're worshiping the same God, or they're going to use the full power of the Canadian government to shut her ministry down under the hate crimes legislation. Now Laurie hadn't committed any crime. She was simply exposing the cults. But you see, with this hate crimes stuff, the cults are able to hide now and drape themselves in hate crimes legislation, giving people the impression that by exposing the cult, you are denying people their religious rights. It's very clever. But it worked. Because when they gave Laurie the ultimatum that either she teach that all the religions are the same or they're going to shut her ministry down, she told him, hey, I guess you're going to have to shut my ministry down because I'm not turning my back on Jesus. And not only did they shut her ministry down, but life got so rough she had to move out of Canada to the United States. The Watchtower organization wants that same power for the whole world so that nobody can speak out against them under penalty that if they do, they can be charged with a hate crime. Now, where are they going to try to get this power? It might surprise you. When I mention Australia and Jehovah's Witnesses, what naturally comes to mind if you're an XJW who's informed? That's right. The Australian Royal Commission on Child Sexual Abuse, they all know how corrupt the Jehovah's Witness group is. The Australian government knows how corrupt the leadership is. It's on video. There's also the regress scheme that the Jehovah's Witness leadership fought tooth and nail to not participate in, where victims of their organization 
were to be paid. The leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses fought against it until the Australian government gave them an ultimatum that either you help these victims by putting money in the pot to help them out or you're going to have to start paying taxes like everybody else. Then all of a sudden that new light came on so fast they got new light that maybe they should put some money in there and help out. You see, when you hit the watchtower in the wallet, it's amazing how many things change. But here's one of the things that I find very interesting and very sad at the same time. Even though Australia knows how corrupt the Jehovah Witness organization is, it appears the watchtower leadership has some friends in high places over there. Because there appears to be some politicians in high places that are willing to look the other way when it comes to all the watchtower crimes and not just look the other way but to give the Jehovah's Witness leaders a weapon that they can then turn around and use against the XJW community in Australia the very same weapon they have in Canada now why in the world would the Australian government do this? Knowing how corrupt this group is, why would they turn around and give them a weapon or prepare to give them a weapon because it hasn't officially happened yet? Why would they be preparing to give them a weapon that they can use against former members to silence them? Now. I'm going to hand you guys over to the mighty Matt Christopher for a few moments because he was the one that sounded the trumpet about this. He lives in Australia and when he got the news about this going on, he posted a video to Facebook and I'm going to present to you part of that video now so you can hear right from somebody on the ground as to what the Jehovah's Witness leadership is doing to try to silence the XJW community in Australia. This is the mighty Matt Christopher from Australia. Hi guys, how are you? Uh, welcome along to my YouTube channel. The discussion today is on the extraordinary claim by the governing body that they have declared war on apostates or opposers or really anybody that speaks out against the policies, procedures um, and direction coming from the governing body. Now the purpose of this video is to inform you as to what's going on and also what we can do to combat this and what the effects are to ourselves uh, and also to our loved ones who may still be active uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Now first of all there's nothing particularly uh, special about the Watchtower Society declaring that they're at war. Um, the second president of the Watchtower Society, J.F. Rutherford, was famous for declaring that uh, they were at war with the police, with the governments, with the court system when they didn't get the verdicts or the decisions that they wanted, with, of course, the media, with uh, the education system, uh, with psychologists, psychiatrists, and so forth. So there's nothing particularly new about Watchtower declaring war. But this particular instance where they are declaring war on who they consider to be apostates, is rather different, and I'll tell you why. For nearly a century, Jehovah's Witnesses have worked their way into recognition, especially into the courts. Uh, while they profess to be no part of the world and they rely on Jehovah God for their protection, they certainly don't demonstrate it by the way in which they cozy up to politicians, to the legal system, uh, to the UN, and to other government organisations that they fear will afford them protection. There's certainly no reliance on their God, Jehovah, when it comes to these matters. Now, this is the point. Those of us in the ex-Jehovah's Witness community now number more than the active Jehovah's Witnesses and the calibre 
of our group is certainly at a very high standard. People who have been at headquarters, been elders, uh, pioneers, ministerial servants, those who have been active Jehovah's Witnesses uh, for decades and decades now have left in disgust. The intel that we have on the organisation is very, very harmful, especially to them as they go through one of the biggest transitions in their 140-year history. You see, at this very moment, Jehovah's Witnesses are trying the very, very di difficult balancing act of trying to keep an ageing population stable and for them not to be spooked by telling them that the end is just so near, but yet on the other side of the coin, they are trying to encourage its younger members to uh, embrace its new way and its uh, tally evangelist style that it's going down. It's going from a bricks and mortar approach to an online business. It is abandoning, if possible, the actual face-to-face -face kingdom halls in which Jehovah's Witnesses used to meet in to a online platform. Now, the simple fact during this time of change, the last thing they want is true accounts of the policies of Jehovah's Witnesses that have in many ways affected people's and millions of people's lives irreversibly. They do not want the rank and file to understand the depth of their cover-up when it comes to child molestation issues, their cover-up when it comes to domestic violence. They do not want to uh, they do not want the, the rank and file to understand the, the full complexity of the parallel legal system that the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses has, uh, has built. And also the need for the elders to keep internal matters, no matter how serious, private and out of the prying eyes of secular authorities. Those of us, those of us who have campaigned against Watchtower, have made it our business to speak to the authorities about the atrocities that we know, and especially the secret database of pedophiles that Jehovah's Witnesses have amassed over decades and decades. We know that this is extremely damaging to Jehovah's Witnesses, and we know that the tsunami of legal action against Watchtower is something that it is fearful of. Now, the issue is this. Why we should take the threat by Watchtower of a war on apostates, why we should take it seriously? Watchtower let the cat out of the bag here in Australia. A few years ago, they approached the Australian government and petitioned for them to adopt a Bill of Rights. Now, there's nothing wrong with a Bill of Rights. Australia doesn't have one. Many countries don't. But it's a way in which uh, people can have their, their freedoms um, entrenched in law, that there can be no ambiguity as to the individual's right to, to worship and to have their, their freedoms as an individual held up in the highest courts in the land and to be codified by our parliament. This is the point I want to talk about, and this is the worrying part. What Jehovah's Witnesses said in part was the same that the Jewish community fears anti-Semitism for all of its dreadful, diabolical behaviour. Jehovah's Witnesses felt exactly the same way, and they were under exactly the same threat, even here in Australia. This is the point. Anti-Semitism stemming from that of the Third Reich is a blight on humanity. And one of the greatest atrocities in human history was carried out against the Jewish people. And we know that governments all over the world monitor and check those who spew hatred towards the Jewish people. In actual fact, being accused of being an anti-Semite is probably one of the worst things that ever can be levelled at someone. Now, this is the point. If Jehovah's Witnesses get their way, if the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses get what they want, they want to present themselves as the same 
and to have their own equivalents of anti-Semites. What that would mean is anybody that speaks out against Jehovah's Witnesses would be viewed the same way as those that speak out against, against Jews. This is extremely dangerous because those of us who speak out do not speak out of bigotry but of facts. And we have learnt from our own experiences the governing body's woeful ability to deal with complex issues such as child molestation and have demonstrated over decades that their own self-interest comes before the welfare of the victims. Another thing that is absolutely unbelievable is that Jehovah's Witnesses, by means of their publications and artist impressions within their their publications depict the destruction of synagogues, mosques and churches and the members of their clergy being killed at Armageddon. They pray for a time when all other people that do not align themselves with the Watchtower thinking will be put to the edge of the sword. It's very interesting. The people that view themselves as being separate and distinct are trying to use the legal system to actually be able to persecute and to put uh, put those aside who would dare criticise their uh, unjust and human behaviour. When it comes to the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses, they have proven that their trust is not in their God, Jehovah, but really their close association with governments and, as I said, the UN. Jehovah's Witnesses were caught out with their uh, affiliation, their membership of the UN, but they continue in Europe doing exactly the same thing. Now, while Jehovah's Witnesses have suffered absolutely atrocious conditions and the situation in Russia is diabolical, I absolutely repudiate the inhuman treatment of Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not deserve what has happened to them in Russia. But this doesn't justify the governing body's attempts to silence critics of their organisation, especially when it is un, uh, in terms of criminal behaviour such as child molestation, domestic violence, and also the psychological damaging practices of disfellowshipping, which leads to shunning. We know so many have committed suicide because of this. It's inhuman for a person to be raised in a faith in which they have no choice uh, but to lose their family, their friends, their support network if they disagree with pivotal um, ideas found in, in the Jehovah's Witness faith. So what I want to say is this. What is really important is that everybody that wants to make a difference, if possible, to be able to make contact with their political representatives in your local area and speak about our situation. You see, human rights have to be for all people, whether one believes or doesn't believe, whether a person in a liberal democracy is Jew, Muslim, Christian, Sikh or Hindu or Jehovah's Witness. No one person takes priority, but all have responsibilities to the wider community. I take the threat of Jehovah's Witnesses and their governing body very, very seriously. We have seen very well-known activists who have been sued and have been shut down because they dare to criticise. Now, this is one of the points that makes it very difficult in terms of combating Jehovah's Witnesses. They are very litigious when it comes to their publications. They are willing to sue anybody for even reading a paragraph from one of their publications that may be 60 or 70 years old. So it makes it very difficult for those of us who wish to present to you the facts on their teaching and what, they, what they've said in the past and the emphatic style in which they have convinced people that they have the truth. My wish is that we stand together and those of us who love freedoms, no matter whether you believe or you don't believe. Jehovah's Witnesses do not have God's backing and never have. Their very existence relies on the largesse of a liberal democracy. 
We see that when they're faced with totalitarian governments, what happens? The organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, unfortunately, has to go underground. Where it flourishes is where there's liberal democracies. Isn't that interesting? There's no divine intervention to stop them from being persecuted, as we can see in Russia. It's really the benefit of living in these, de these liberal democracies like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the US, Europe, and so forth, in which people of all faiths and no faiths are able to live in peace and express themselves. But Jehovah's Witnesses have shown themselves to be hypocrites. On one side, publishing the idea that they have the truth and that all other people, no matter what their religion is, or their way of life, if it doesn't line up with a Jehovah's Witness way of thinking, then they face destruction by their God, Jehovah. This is very, very serious. Jehovah's Witnesses are attempting, and have always attempted, to cement themselves into the law of the land, to make themselves out to be the doyan of freedom of speech, but yet persecuted on the other hand. The fact of the matter is that they are really playing a uh, a double edged they're, they're playing like a double edged sword. On one side, they want the freedoms and all of the rights that go with a liberal democracy, and on the other side, they wish to condemn people by their literature and their behaviour. Rather than being the most peaceful and loving people in the world, while they don't physically carry out any attacks on people their propaganda and their teaching belies their real issues when it comes to other people. They are not peaceable. Anybody that claims that if you don't believe the way that I do or you do, that you deserve divine judgment, that you and your family deserve to be killed because you are wicked and displeasing to God, this is something that is unacceptable in the very democracy in which Jehovah's Witnesses wish to cement themselves. I hope that this video is of benefit to you, and as I always say, thank you very much for your love and support as we go on this journey. There'll be many more videos to come, and as uh, I've said to you, I really appreciate the love and support that you send me. So please, like and subscribe. I'm Matt Christopher. Thank you for listening. Isn't it surprising? Who would have ever thought that Australia would bow down to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society? But you see, when I heard about that, I thought about something. My King James Bible here. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You see, so many good things have been happening to expose the Jehovah's Witness group. Cable documentaries exposing the group and things that are going on. The XJW community getting excited like, man, yes, the Watchtower is about to come crumbling down. And then you look a little closer and go, wait a minute, what's that? And lo and behold... While we think the watchtower is about to topple over, you look around the backside and there are government authorities around the world trying to prop it back up. While the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses claim to have no dealings with government, they've been lying to their members all along. So they're trying to get this power now in Australia to silence the XJWs. Do you think this is coming to America? Do they have their tentacles in any politicians or political groups in America? This couldn't happen in America, could it? I want to thank Linda James. For sending me this video a while back. I did watch it, Linda. I'm going to use some of it here. And I thank you for bringing it to my attention. 
So while claiming that they have no ties to any politics, mainly the United Nations, I want you to understand what you're looking at right here. What you are seeing is a table with several people sitting here, and they are reporting to the media. Let's identify who these people are. And then also uh, those of you watching online. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Bird. Uh, I'm the policy advisor for the Policy Commission. Uh, and I want to say uh, just a quick word about uh, format. Our first uh, panelist, uh, Ambassador Michael Kozak, actually has a, a hard stop at 3 o'clock. So after introducing our panelists, uh, I'm going to turn it over to him for opening remarks. Uh, I will then ask him uh, a series of questions. He'll answer them. I'll then open it up to questions uh, for him from our uh, fellow panelists, as well as uh, to those of you in the audience uh, and those of you watching online. Uh, it is a delight uh, to begin with Ambassador Kozak. He is uh, a longtime uh, friend and uh, colleague of the Helsinki Commission. He actually led the uh, delegation to the, uh, to the Asian meetings uh, this, uh, this past fall. Um, and by all accounts, did, uh, did a fantastic job. So it's good to, it's good to have you here. Ambassador, Mike, uh, Ambassador Kozak is a charter member of the Career Senior Executive Service in the United States government. He has served in a number of senior positions in the U.S. Executive Branch, including Senior Director of the National Security Staff from 2005 to 2009, as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State level positions in three different bureaus. Acting Assistant Secretary of State for extended periods of time, Ambassador <coughs> and Chief of Mission in Havana, Cuba. Ambassador Kozak was a U.S. negotiator with Cuba to secure the return of criminals sent to the United States during the Marielle boat crisis. He also helped implement the Camp David Accords and negotiate the withdrawal of the PLO from Lebanon. Ambassador Kozak has been awarded the State Department's Superior Honor Award. Younger Federal Lawyer Award, Presidential Ranks of Distinguished and Meritorious Executive, and the Order of Balboa, presented by the President of Panama. He received his AB in Political Science and Law degree uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. Welcome. Dr. Danielle Mark is the Chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He is an assistant professor of political science at Villanova University. There, he teaches political theory, philosophy of law, and politics, and religion. At Villanova, he is a faculty associate of the Matthew J. Ryan Center for the Study of Free Institutions and Public Good, and he holds the rank of battalion professor in Villanova's Navy Reserve Officers Training Corps Unit. For the 2017 18 academic year, Dr. Mark is on leave from Villanova as a visiting fellow in the Tocqueville Program for Inquiry into Religion and Public Life at the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Mark is a fellow of the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton, New Jersey, and works with the Tikva Fund in New York. He is also a member of the Advisory Council of Canaan Office. He has served as an assistant editor of the journal Interpretation and is a contributor to the Arc of the Universe blog. In addition to his academic writing, Dr. Mark has published on topics related to international religious freedom, and US, news, U.S. News and World Report, and other outlets and publications. He holds a BA, MA, and PhD from the Department of Politics at Princeton University. Before graduate school, he was a high school history teacher for four years in New York City. Welcome. Next, uh, we'll hear from Dr. Kathleen Collins. Dr. Collins is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Minnesota. She is the researcher for Central Asia for the Under Caesar's Sword Project, pioneered by the University of Notre Dame and the Religious Freedom Research Project at the Berkeley Center at Georgetown University, focuses on the repression and persecution of Christians globally. The project's book, edited by Daniel Philpott and Tim Shaw, is forthcoming with you Cambridge University Press. Dr. Collins is the author of Clan Politics and Regime Transition in Central Asia, which won the Central Asia Studies Society Book Award for Social Sciences. She has published articles in various journals and edited uh, in edited volumes, including Comparative Politics, World Politics, 
the Journal of Democracy, Europe and Eurasia Studies, Political Research Quarterly, the Brown Journal of International Affairs and Asia Policy. She is currently writing two new books, tentatively titled The Rise of Islamist Movements, Islam and State in Central Asia and the Caucasus, and Muslim Politics, Islam, Politics, and Public Opinion in Post-Soviet Kyrgyzstan and Azerbaijan. Collins has received grants from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the MacArthur Foundation, the Kellogg Institute, the United States Institute of Peace, IREX, and the National Council for Eurasian and East European Research, among others. And then finally, we'll hear from Philip Brumley. Brumley is the general counsel for Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, Pennsylvania. He received his law degree in 1988 from Brooklyn Law School in New York. He has represented Jehovah's Witnesses in the U.S. Supreme Court and the European Court of Human Rights. Additionally, he supervised the filing of complaints to the UN Human Rights Committee that resulted in 15 favorable decisions. In addition to his work on behalf of religious freedom, he is an instructor at the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead and the School for Branch Committee Members in Patterson, New York. Ambassador Cousin. Now, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, the governments are of the devil, and the United Nations is really of the devil. So now you have these two demonic organizations, according to the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses, there at the table. So, Philip Brumley is the lead lawyer for the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, the lead lawyer for the Jehovah's Witnesses. How did he end up sitting at the table with the United Nations representatives and a high-ranking U.S. government representative? How did he get invited to this? Do you know who's missing at that table? You are. You see, the only side that the governments around the world have been able to hear when it comes to this group is the Watchtower side, is the Jehovah's Witnesses side. They've already made it clear that there are those who are entitled to know the truth and those who are not entitled to know the truth. And if any information comes out that makes the group look bad, they want to make sure that that information never sees the light of day outside the group. So they're never going to tell these government officials and they're never going to tell the United Nations the real history of their group, the real story of the teachings and doctrines of their group and how they treat former members, how they abuse former members, how they persecute former members. They're never going to mention that. Your side of the story never gets told. And I can guarantee you the people sitting there at that table do not sit back and watch XJW YouTube videos. They have no idea what this organization has done. Neither have they researched this group. How do I know? I want you to listen to a statement that is being made in a few moments by this government official to let you see just how uninformed he is about the Jehovah's Witness group and their teachings, their background, and their history. Take a listen to what this guy says. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Just had a question regarding the situation of Jehovah's Witnesses in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. uh, we seem to be caught between two forces within the government. There's one force that seems to be leaning towards applying the rule of law, protecting our rights, and opposing forces that are seeking to imitate what's going on in Russia. And I appreciate so much that you mentioned uh, the situation of Timur Akhmedov, who's in prison right now, yep. basically on trumped up charges. Um, do you have a comment on whether the rule of law is strengthening or whether the legal status that we have right now is even more in danger? In, in uh, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan. Yeah, it's, you know, I'm trying to predict, because I think you're right, you get these different forces, and particularly when you know, a lot of these, these states in that region, they've had the same leader since they became independent and, you know, as President Karimov dying shows that 
nobody is immortal. Mm -hmm. And so I think people are like thinking about somewhere down the line and unfortunately Jehovah's Witnesses and other groups get caught up in all of that. So it's kind of hard to predict what they will do. I mean, I, what I can say more is what we're urging them to do, which is follow the rule of law. Don't don't persecute groups for, and they've tried to, to do it a la Russia, as you say, where they say, well, any, any religious thought that isn't approved by the government is, quote, extremism. And it's like, you know, when was the last time that, uh, you know, a, a band of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, took up arms and, you know, right. uh, attacked somebody? It's just... Never. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it, it's, you know, manifestly absurd what they're, what they're uh, worrying about. Now, this man is the guy in charge. The full weight and power of the United States government at his back. Yet he has no clue what Jehovah's Witnesses actually teach and believe. No clue. He has no idea that one of the official teachings of the Jehovah's Witnesses is that him, he, soon will die at Armageddon because he's not a Jehovah's Witness. He has no idea that the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that men like him who are members of the government are emissaries of Satan. That's what they teach. He has no idea that their religion teaches that soon, right around the corner, when Armageddon breaks out, he's going to be set on fire and his body's going to pop open like a hot dog on a grill. Remember that one? He has no idea that when the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses lit that match and blew it out, that he was one of the guys that the leadership's talking about is going to fade away like smoke. He has no idea the hatred the whole witnesses have for him because he's not a member of their group. But there he is defending him. And he makes this statement that calling the Jehovah's Witnesses an extremist group is outrageous or ludicrous or you name the word. And then he says, when is the last time you've ever seen a Jehovah's Witness come after somebody with a gun? And they all laugh. Why did they laugh? They laugh because they actually believe the lies that they were told by the Jehovah's Witness leadership. They've never heard your story. They've never heard what you've been through. They've never heard about you being kept away from your family because you left the group and your family stayed in the group. They never heard about those of you who've been abused. They've never heard about the kidnappings, the rapes, and the murders. Oh, have you heard of those? Are you aware of how many murders Jehovah's Witnesses have done? Obviously, he hasn't got a clue. Obviously not. That he would make a statement like that. So on your screen, I have a website, AAWA Map Project. Now, I'm going to show how easy it was to find this. You simply go on your search engine and you type in Crimes of Jehovah's Witnesses. And boom, there it is. Website after website. This one here is a map, and they acknowledge that the map is not covering every single crime. They can't find all of them, because many times the news media will mention the crime, but won't say that the person was a Jehovah's Witness. But for these, you will see, these are the ones where they actually say, yes, the person who did the crime is a Jehovah's Witness. Now, I'm going to scroll down, and it's really going to be surprising to you guys to see everything from stalking and assault to sexual abuse and murders, suicides, the Watchtower organization being sued. Look at this long list of Jehovah's Witnesses and murders around the world. This guy says, when is the last time you've ever seen somebody come after somebody with a gun? When's the last time you've ever seen a Jehovah's Witness come after somebody with a gun? 
You mean to tell me that he's in charge of religious rights and freedoms in the United States of America? And he's completely unaware of this list of Jehovah's Witnesses who've committed murders? The very first one on the list, let me look at the screen over here. I'm trying to look at the screen right next to the camera here. A school shooting. Let's take a look at that one. School shooting. What is this? 12 students killed? 12 students killed. By a Jehovah's Witness. And yes, he did use a gun. But you see, it never made it to the American press. So I guess it never happened because it didn't make it to the American news media. They never cover the real stories. They like fake news. I don't have time to go through all of these. I will give you guys the links. If you want the full stories, all you have to do, you can click on them. It'll give you the stories. And for many of them, just find the names of the, of the person who committed the crime. Highlight like a paragraph. Go to your search engine and paste that on your search engine. And you can find all the different news agencies that covered that particular issue. I'm going to take some time just to talk about a couple of them. So let's do that. This here is Dinell Lane. She had a 19-month-old that drowned in 2002. According to the paper here, it says his funeral was held at a Jehovah's Witness Hall in Pueblo, Colorado. So what is she accused of doing now? A woman is under arrest in Colorado, accused of stabbing a pregnant woman in the stomach and removing her unborn baby. Police say the 26-year-old expectant mother visited the suspect's home north of Denver on Wednesday to buy baby clothes advertised on Craigslist. Officers called to the scene found the victim stabbed and beaten. The officer did an incredible job today. He, he got here with limited information, heard her calling for help, and he went in and found her and got her out of the house. The unborn child died. Police say the suspect was arrested when she took the baby to a hospital and claimed she'd had a miscarriage. Charges against her include attempted first-degree murder. The victim is expected to recover. Sandy Kozell, the Associated Press. So, obviously, that gentleman didn't know about these things and so much more that's on these websites that I'm going to be giving you the link for. As you scroll down, as you see, it says here that her son who died in 2002 the funeral was held at a Jehovah's Witness Hall Jehovah's Witnesses don't do funerals for any other religion so what religion is this lady obviously Jehovah's Witness this next one here is uh, the death sentence is handed down for Christian Longo accused of murdering his wife Mary Jane and their youngest daughter Madison he being a Jehovah's Witness. A lot of these articles never seem to make it to the TV and cable news. But you guys will have access to all these things with the links that I'll be providing in the video. And this guy in the government didn't know about all this? So, this man who's in charge of religious rights and freedoms has no knowledge of these heinous crimes Luring a pregnant woman to your house so that you can cut the baby out of her belly? But hey, he didn't use a gun, right? You see how stupid that sounds? But guess what? Voices of reason like these are not being heard by these groups. XJW community, I hope you'll listen to me. Okay? I've never been a Jehovah's Witness. You already know that. But I care enough for you guys to keep sticking my neck out. So here I am again with my neck sticking out. 
If you guys want the XJW community to survive, I want you to understand something. First of all, you need to change your name. You got to change your name. There's more to you than being an X anything. You have talents, you have gifts, you have goals. You're not an X nothing. If somebody says, I want to talk to you about my ex, do you think it's going to be good news? You don't want to be an ex nothing. I got a new name for you. Call you by a new name, a name that's going to get some respect in this world. World couldn't care less about an ex this ex that. It's time to call you who you really are. You're a whistleblower against the watchtower. That's who you are. You see, if you call yourself an ex Jehovah's Witness and you try to approach the United Nations and you call them up or you call up the ACLU or you call up any of these civil rights groups because your rights have been infringed upon by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society that holds your family captive to try to force you to return to their group that you don't want to be in. No religion should have the authority to punish you because you left. But the outside world doesn't know Jehovah's Witnesses do that. They need to be told. But if you approach them saying you're an X this, X that, they couldn't give a crap about it. X something. The leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses will just say, well, they're just a disgruntled former member. They're an ex Jehovah's Witness. But if you approach these world leaders, identifying yourself as who you are, a whistleblower, exposing the Watchtower organization, if the Watchtower dares speak out against you, that corporation is seen as attacking a whistleblower. And that never looks good for a corporation. You need to start calling yourselves what you are. You're whistleblowers. You're blowing the whistle on the watchtower. And wouldn't it be something if you got the attention of the United Nations by calling them up? And so many whistleblowers against the watchtower are calling them up and contacting them on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. That it gets their attention that there's a lot of people out here that's been hurt by this group. And they need to be heard. If you don't step up and defend yourself, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the only one that has their ear. And they've had their ear for years. That's why the leadership feels so confident right now that the XJW community is going to blow away like smoke because these world bodies never hear from you they're not going to watch your YouTube video they need to hear your voice they need to see your face they need you to contact them so that they can know you exist because right now they don't know they've never heard from you and there are tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of XJWs who need to raise your voices and get a hold of United Nations and their religious rights division and tell them your story. Don't tell them you're XJW nothing. Let them know you're a whistleblower. You've got a story to tell. If you have texts that were sent to you from family members telling you that they're not going to speak to you anymore unless you come back to the organization, you save that and you show it to these world authorities and say, this is what they teach my family members. They are holding me back from my own family. No religion should be allowed to do this. I don't have the power to do it. I don't have the standing. I've never been a Jehovah's Witness. You have the authority to do it because you're the one who's been harmed by them. I've told you in earlier videos, every single ex-Jehovah's Witness that's being held back from seeing their families should individually sue the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Make them stand in court in front of a judge and justify why they won't let you talk to your mom, why they won't let you talk to your dad, why they won't let you talk to your children. Let them try to justify that in front of a court of law. The leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses recently came out. I was watching uh, J.W. Escape's video. Might have been hers talking about the leadership of the Jehovah's Witnesses claiming that uh, 
organizations settling out of court is not an admission of guilt. And they're trying to get themselves off the hook for all of these child sexual abuse cases where they have settled out of court. Millions and millions, tens of millions of dollars paid out to these sexual abuse victims. Story this evening, reaction right now from the National Organization for Jehovah Witnesses after it was ordered to pay $13.5 million to a San Diego man who says he was abused as a child by his Bible teacher. NBC7's Rory Devine is live in Linda Vista right now to tell us what that organization, uh, known as the Watchtower, is saying. Rory? It's saying it will appeal, Monica, saying it will look for a complete review of this case, which had its roots here referred to in the lawsuit as the Linda Vista Spanish Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. This is where the man, who is now 35 years old, says he was a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses as a child and where, according to the lawsuit, he says he met the quote-unquote perpetrator. Now, according to the lawsuit, Jose Lopez, seen here when he was seven years old, was sexually abused by, quote, perpetrator in approximately 1986. According to legal documents, the perpetrator is identified as Gonzalo Campos, seen here in a deposition. The perpetrator is described in the suit as a Bible study instructor in the leadership of the Linda Vista Church who gave Lopez a Bible study. Lopez's attorney says the $13.5 million judgment was awarded not against the Linda Vista Church, but against the governing entity, Watchtower. It included $10.5 million in punitive damages for what the attorney called an attempt at a cover-up. And it reflects ten and a half million dollars in punitive damages. Damages that reflect the reprehensible conduct of the Watchtower and how they covered this up for years and allowed multiple children to be injured. They, they protected and harbored a criminal. According to the statement from an attorney involved in the case, the judgment was awarded, quote, following a hearing at which Watch Watchtower was barred from participating. It goes on to say Watchtower believes the appellate court will ultimately agree the trial court abused its discretion. We're going to have more on that part of the story coming up on the News at 6. Reporting live, I'm Murray Devine, NBC7. And they're trying to imply, hey, just because they sat out of court doesn't mean that they're guilty. And one thing that frustrates me about the leadership of this group is how they always leave out important information. You see, they don't just settle out of court, folks. They don't just hand the victim money and say, please go away. No. No. In order for that victim to get the money, this is what he left out. Before they can get the money, they got to sign a gag order. What's a gag order? A gag order is you agree to take these millions of dollars in exchange for keeping your mouth shut and not telling the world what the Watchtower did to you. They're buying their silence in order to protect their reputation. And it doesn't matter what anybody has to say. We all know the slogan. Money talks and everything else walks, okay? You fill in the blanks what everything else is. You put enough money out there, the money's going to be taken. And the people's silence have been bought. Well, victims of this kind of abuse say it is the worst kind. People of faith preying on people who pray. The group Silent Lambs was in Nashville today showing their support for people who say they've been abused by Jehovah's Witnesses and others. Recently, lawsuits were settled in some cases, but not to the satisfaction of Silent Lambs. Channel 4's Cynthia Williams is live now at Kingdom Hall in West Nashville with the story. Cynthia? Well, there are about six Kingdom Halls in the Nashville area, including the one here in West Nashville that's over my shoulder. And today, Silent Lambs attached this bulletin to the door of each one. At least, that attempt was made. You saw uh, recently 16 lawsuits were settled. Who called you? Silent Lambs met with vocal resistance today at a Kingdom Hall in Woodbine. You haven't been invited on the property. For six years now, the Kentucky-based organization has offered support for people alleging abuse within the Jehovah's Witnesses faith. In March, settlements were reached in more than a dozen molestation cases, 
agreements that came with gag orders attached. We find this bittersweet. On one hand, we're glad a few victims were finally getting some financial help, but on the other hand, we're sad and worried because they've essentially, they've been forced to give up their right. Bill Bowen is a former Jehovah's Witness and founder of Silent Lambs. He was surrounded by abuse victims today from various faiths. When I was around eight years old, I was molested by a teenager who was a member of my church at Christian Gospel Temple. There are thousands of us out there and thousands of children that need our help right now. My parents nor anyone else ever knew that I was abused by an elder. According to Silent Lambs, the Jehovah's Witnesses' policies encourage abuse by not reporting allegations to police, choosing instead to handle individual cases internally. Today, a stuffed lamb was placed on the doors of area kingdom halls, telling victims they need be silent no more. And victims groups say that they are critical of these gag orders because they tend to keep the identity of the predator secret while re-victimizing the victim. Live in West Nashville, I'm Cynthia Williams, Channel 4 News. The Jehovah's Witnesses headquarters in Brooklyn was supposed to send a faxed response today, but as of news time, we had not received any. And by buying these people off with these gag orders and millions of dollars placed at their bank account of the victims to buy their silence, the Watchtower organization is able to walk away scot-free, keeping their squeaky clean image, because now this victim is not allowed to tell their story of what happened. So I have an idea. Why don't all of you sue the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society individually and make them pay all of you millions of dollars each? Don't settle for a class action lawsuit. Everybody sue them individually. They're holding you back from your family. You sue them because they're infringing on your rights. No religion should have the authority to do that. Let them settle you out of court and bankrupt them. Make them sell the kingdom halls and give you the money. You see, the only thing this group cares about is money and reputation. So hit them where it counts. But the first thing you need to do is make your voice heard. And YouTube videos are perfectly fine, but they're not going to get the job done you got to get a hold of civil rights organizations in your country let them know you are a whistleblower about to blow the whistle on the watchtower bible and tract society the jehovah's witness organization you've got a story to tell you tell them your story don't worry about calling yourself xjw they don't want to hear that jack identify yourself as who you are whistleblower Blow the whistle on this place. And I got a feeling if enough of you raise your voice, if enough of you make your voices heard, that tower that's toppling over, that we all want to see come down, because I want to see your families come free, folks. I want to see them come free. I want to see you guys be able to come together again. Wouldn't it be something? If those government officials who are fighting so hard to keep the watchtower upright. If they heard your voice and realized, what, why are we defending this place? Why are we defending these pedophiles? Why are we defending these people who are de harboring pedophiles and murderers and all these other criminals? And have those politicians switch sides and help you push the tower over. My King James Bible says, the Lord says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins, and I'll heal their land. A lot of you in the XJW community your land is wounded. Your heart is wounded. There are missing pieces where family belongs and it's not there. It's about time we get the pieces of the puzzle put back together. But it ain't going to happen 
unless the XJW community gets back to praying to the Lord Jesus, ask him for help, and then get a hold of the civil rights organizations in your country. Let them know you're a whistleblower. You've got a story to tell. Tell them your story. Get your name out there. Get your face out there. Don't be afraid. YouTube videos are easy. They're easy. This is a fight. And the leadership of the Jehovah's is not joking around. They want you guys gone. And they think they got you on the ropes right now. That's why they're so confident. But be like Muhammad Ali with the rope a dope. His opponent thought that he had him because Muhammad Ali is leaning back on them ropes and he's taking every blow and he's taking every blow and he's taking every blow. And little did the opponent know that Muhammad Ali was leaning against those ropes so that he wouldn't fall. He knew if he was standing in the center of the ring and took those punches, it would knock him out. But because he's leaning against the ropes, he can't fall. So his opponent is tiring himself out as he puts blow after blow after blow. His opponent's tiring himself out round after round after round. His opponent is tiring himself out. And then when Muhammad Ali realized, okay, he's all gas now. He's out of gas. He thought he had you on the ropes. He's out of breath. They're so confident. They're blowing out matches. They're dancing on your grave. But we ain't dead yet, are we? No. They're playing right into our hands. Our hands. You see, even though I've never been a member, I consider you as my family and friends. The United Nations has heard from the Watchtower Organization for years. These civil rights organizations have heard from the Watchtower Organization for years. And they've been lied to by this organization for years. It's time to hear from you. It's time they hear from you. There's way more of you than it is them. And the world bodies need to hear it. They need to hear from you. This has been wearing me down emotionally and I had to put together a video. I had to come out and say something. And I'm hoping you guys will step up and do something. I do not want to see the XJW community go away. I want you to remember something. If you don't think it's possible for the XJW community to lose their voice on social media, I want you to remember something. Donald Trump was the test case for social media to see how the people would react if a sitting president was removed from every social media site that gives him a voice. In America, we have freedom of speech. You may not like what a person says, but they got the freedom to say it. That's what makes our country great. In some countries, you speak what the government don't like, they'll arrest you and kill you. In America, we have the freedom to speak our mind. And we better treasure that or we can lose it and lose it fast. If they can cancel Trump and kick him off of every social media channel where he can't speak to the people, I don't care if you like him or not. He was a test case. If they can do it to him, they can do it to you. That's the point I'm trying to get across. I don't want you guys to be canceled. Mainly with the Watchtower and their lies. To have them win? After all this? To have them win? No. It's time for the XJW community to contact these world authorities. Get on your phone send emails, contact the people in the religious rights departments of your country, identify yourself as a whistleblower, tell your story. Get your names, your voices out there. 
and show the watchtower that even though they think we're going to disappear like smoke we shall see we shall see we certainly shall see feel free to check out my music site guys jasonzelda.com people have asked how they could support my ministry let's go on the site listen to some music buy some music if you want I'd really appreciate it and until next we meet as I say I am working on another video dealing with this cult one more time I can't talk about what it's about because I can't let the enemy know what I'm up to but I'll see you guys down the road good night everybody